Now outside of clinical trials, let's take our clinic day. You have a brand new patient, new patient day, where you see somebody just diagnosed with metastatic pancreatic cancer. So Eileen, we have some treatment options that are available uh, for these patients. How do you approach this and what do you think? You see the patient? So meeting a new patient, untreated, putting aside clinical trial options, present the two current standards of care for good performance status patients in terms of fulfirinox or gemcitabine and uh, paclitaxel. And I have relative equipoise with these. I think we're excited to have options and excited to have choices for patients. And I think depending on the person, the individual and their setting, uh, one may prove to be a better fit. So for example, uh, some patients may have concerns about having a port and having an infusional uh, treatment with fulfirinox. Uh, other patients may have concerns about alopecia with napaclitaxel-based therapy, and that may help uh, decide. And I say to patients, we don't know, but we know from other diseases, it doesn't matter which order you get, uh, the drugs, but hopefully you'll have opportunity to be exposed to all of the active drugs in this disease. And I suspect that principle holds true in pancreas cancer and uh, encourage people to, uh, you know, make sure they're comfortable uh, with their choices and discuss the issues of growth factors, uh, discuss the schedule issues in terms of weekly versus every other week, it may depend a little bit where they live. And some will have come in with a very strong opinion in terms of what's right for them. and. I, I think in the absence of definitive data to suggest otherwise, uh, you know, that, that's reasonable. I mean, certainly there's, some people will make a choice on first-line treatment option based on toxicity profile. You know, it, like you alluded to with the gemcitabine and nabpaclitaxel with the issues with thrombocytopenia, neutropenia, mm -hmm. that you can see with fulfirinox, the issues with nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. And I think a lot of us self-modify mm -hmm. um, these regimens mm -hmm. to try to make these regimens more tolerable, but yet not lose out on efficacy. You know, John, I think there have been some recent publications that have looked at modification of both of these regimens and what kind of impact these have had on, on treatment of the patients. Yeah, so I don't actually think I've ever given classic fulfirinox. I, I'm thinking if I <laughs> even did it once. Um, so uh, most of us um, sort of adopt a drop the bolus 5-FU quickly because we sort of rationalize that they're getting plenty of 5-FU that's only adding toxicity. And then I almost always will cut the arinotecan down, usually just to 150, but there are lots of different strategies. And what's nice about that is that, as you referred to, there are now some studies that actually looked at whether it's response rate or progression-free survival in single-arm studies with dose modifications that in essence, in some cases, are performing better than the phase three randomized trial. So at least we're reassured that we're not too far off um, from what the published data is in a, in a controlled randomized trial. So, and I don't really think I could give the standard regimen regularly um, with, uh, you know, to people. I'm, even the, the current modifications, I almost always give a growth factor. It's the only time I ever order a growth factor as a GI oncologist, I think, is the only time. Um, and, you know, it's still hard to manage. It's intensive antiemetics, um, which is what we'll start with, and then uh, often the fatigue element. So it, even with modifications, um, we, pr we all buckle in for what might be a rough cycle or two until we get the dosing right. Yeah, and I mean, certainly even with gemcitabine and napaclitaxel, there are some folks that are doing modifications for that regimen as well. Um, Eileen, tell us a little bit about this every other week concept. Yeah, so the group in Ohio State looked at this a couple of years ago, and their data has been recently reported looking at people with untreated, newly diagnosed pancreas cancer and giving full dose every other week and supporting favorable outcomes, comparatively speaking, uh, with the potential advantages of less cumulative toxicity in terms of neuropathy, uh, maybe less issues with myelosuppression and growth factor uh, requirements, and perhaps an economic uh, gain. I think we don't know whether that's the right fit for, for all patients, and it's certainly not the FDA-approved uh, regimen, but I think it's heartening uh, if one is running into toxicity that there's nice data to suggest that this is a maybe a very reasonable strategy to consider. Yeah. So are you going to go up on the dose, though? Are you going to go from 125 to 150? 
there is some data out there that yeah. says that going to 150 may be more beneficial. And mm -hmm. if you did the math, it's really not that different. It's about 10 percent. But yeah, that data is out there, and you know the Hoxter data from Brown with uh, using 150, and then the folks down in Houston do the 150 every two weeks mm -hmm. also. But they also give it with uh, fixed dose rate gemcitabine. Oh, <laughs> blast wow. from the so past. people are modifying the <laughs> but, other um, way around. But if right? you are going to do that, my point is, I think you can dial up the abraxane and the nabacotaxel. Struggle uh, a little. We're, bit we're two week physicians, right? I mean, we don't we treat people every two weeks, so we don't know how to treat people every week. So <laughs> maybe that's what it is. Yeah. So yeah. I think it's reassuring that, and as uh, as John says, I think a lot of us use modified fulfurinox and, and like that and are comfortable with that, and are confident by not seeing uh, adverse outcomes in terms of non-randomized data. But you could think of the argument the same way. So, you know, what's there to gain in terms of going up? It's pro probably toxicity. Yeah, maybe. There's I a love reason it. why this they is put a it debate. Yeah, the no, table, this is right? perfect. Well, and it, I, you know, I sort of think of this as I got so many milligrams to give before I get into some cumulative neurotoxicity, too. So if I can get that benefit with a lower dose, then maybe I can go a little longer exactly. uh, than playing harder and, and up front. But I, you know, I think I, all of these things are supported, and you sort of make your decision based on the person sitting in front of you. If, if, I, if I don't mind to interject, but yeah. I'm old enough to tell that, uh, you know, the phase one trial of gemcita being given every other week, the maximum tolerated dose was not reached at 4.9 grams yeah. per meter square given every other week. The investigator got, just got tired of escalating the dose and said enough is enough. There was basically no myelosuppression. So every time you run into myelosuppression in the pairing gemcitabine with any other cytotoxic drug, that's a way to overcome that. You just keep gemcitabine on every other week. But I think that starting up on every other week, I feel a little bit uncomfortable yeah. just because we have phase two efficacy instead of phase three. But I think it would be a good way to adjust the dose if mm -hmm. you cannot deliver the weekly schedule. That's my position.